If you could take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter number 5. Luke chapter number 5. So just a little uh, personal note, I guess, to start out. It, because of our commitment to preach through books of the Bible, uh, it, is a, it can be a, a little bit of a challenge. My, my habit is every Monday morning, I, which Monday is my day off normally, um, every Monday morning, uh, I look at the passage that I'm going to be preaching the following Sunday. And sometimes I look at the passage and I'm thinking to myself, oh man, I really don't want to preach on this. Because it's a tough topic, right? And then other times I look at the passage and I think, oh man, I'm, I'm a little bit excited about this. And then other times you look at a passage and you read through it and you're thinking, what on earth are we going to say about that this week? But here's, here's the, the interesting part, the good part about it, is between Monday and Friday, the Holy Spirit illuminates His Word and there's an excitement to share spiritual truth. And today is, is uh, no, no exception. As a matter of fact, when I read the passage Monday, I was thinking to myself, what exactly am I going to say about some of the, the parts of this passage? And by the time we get to Friday, or Thursday, I should say maybe, uh, we're cutting out stuff because it's just so good. It's such a good passage. So if you'll stand with me, we'll begin Luke chapter 5, verse number 12. And we're going to read through verse number 26, although we're not going to look at the whole passage today. We're going to read everything because they're, they're connected. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him into the midst before Jesus, and when he, I'm sorry, I have uh, messed up here. Let me just, um, let me go back here. And But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth. There's that word authority that we were looking at last week, right? Authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what um, he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God, and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Lord, we thank you for, the again, once again, the baptisms today. We thank you for your word and, and how that on the surface, uh, everything seems simple and cut and dried. And then as we dig, we find deeper things and and the holy spirit illumines more things in our hearts and i i pray that today this passage will be a blessing to us all when we understand uh the 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 picture that's being shown us today through this miracle that christ performed in his name we pray amen thank you so much so th this is a passage about two different healings uh, the first healing is 
somebody who is an outcast, a leper. The second story that we will get to next week is a story about a man who was paralyzed, a paralytic who was let down through a roof. And these two are connected. These two scenes in Jesus' life are connected. I want to show that next week. I can't make the connection today because today I need to set it up. But the connection we will make next week. But this first healing, this guy is a leper. He's an outcast. Luke said that there was a man who came who was full of leprosy. Now, that, that's very important. <clears throat> Today, what we call leprosy is, is called Hansen's disease. I think probably everybody here knows what Hansen's disease is. However, reading Leviticus 14 and some other passages, we understand that back then, what, is called, what was called leprosy was actually a variety of skin diseases. The biblical term for leprosy refers to a wide variety of skin ailments. Some of them are fatal, and especially in biblical times, in its most extreme form, leprosy is a neurological disorder, and it numbs people to sensitivity to pain, and it revolt, results in a disfigured body. And I'm sure you've read some of the stories of people who had Hansen's disease who were able to pick up live coals of fire off a of fire, and it burnt their skin off, and they didn't even know that they were, there was pain involved in it. And so it, it, it causes you, you get disfigured because you don't realize that your body is hurting. According to the ancient historian Josephus, lepers were treated as if they were, in effect, dead men. They were, they were the walking dead. It's like they did not exist. Lepers had to live in isolation. They were outside the community. They're outside the covenant community of God. They lost all social connections. People could not be around lepers at all. All their connection to society was broken. And so they, they lived in isolation. They lived in little groups, leper colonies. Many, many forms of the disease that the Bible calls leprosy, they were highly contagious. And because of that, the, we, we know from history and, and the writings that, that priests were allowed to get no closer than six feet upwind from a leper and 150 feet downwind from a leper. Because if you got some of the severe forms of leprosy, it was, they were, which were highly contagious, it was automatically fatal. There was, there was nothing that they could do about it. See, a leper was not just ill. He was an outcast. He, he, simply, he had not simply just lost his wealth. He lost his family. He lost his friends. He lost his home. He lost his livelihood. No one would, as a matter of fact, nobody was allowed to associate with a leper. You were not allowed to associate with a leper at all. He, this man who came to Jesus, most likely was highly disfigured. Ugly to look at. He was full of leprosy. The idea is, when you looked at him, all you saw was leprosy and all the ill effects of the leprosy. And what's interesting is that leprosy is an ugly, but it's an accurate illustration of our spiritual condition before we respond to the gospel. At the time of Christ, people generally assumed that if one got leprosy, that was a sign of God's curse against sin, particularly their sin. They were cursed, according to people in the society. In a sense, the man, this man who came to Jesus, his outward condition is indicative of his inward condition and the condition of everyone who is without Christ. So, that's a little bit about leprosy. So here comes this man. The Bible says he's full of leprosy. When you look at him, all you see is leprosy. And he comes to Jesus, and what did he do? Look at your verses. Verse number 12 and 13. He said, the Bible says that he fell on his face 
and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make him clean. Now, this very act was shocking. Remember what I said about how contagious it was. There were laws that lepers were not supposed to come into town, and we know that Jesus was in a town at this time. And so, because leprosy was so contagious and oftentimes deadly, deadly lepers could be stoned to death for coming into town. So he was, he was risking his life. He was risking stoning just coming to Jesus. We can, now, the, just back off for just a minute. The, the picture is Jesus and a man, and think about everybody else that's around Jesus right now. They're horrified. How dare you let this leper, how dare you as a leper come in and contaminate? We can become unclean because of you. The, they were horrified that this man approached violating every convention of polite society. And in this account, we see several important characteristics of this man that we can learn from. The first one is that he was desperate. Aren't you seeing desperation in this man? He was desperate for healing. He wanted his condition changed. And there was no cure for his condition. He wanted a change in condition with something that there is no cure. And yet, he knew the power of Jesus to heal. He'd heard it. He'd heard the news. And, and so he knew that Jesus had the ability to heal. So when he, when he came to Jesus, the Bible says that he fell on his face. Now what's interesting about this little phrase, fell on his face, is oftentimes in the New Testament, it's, it's used as a phrase that talks about worshiping God. The, the word is, is, is good for when an unbeliever comes to an assembly, according to Paul. Paul, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, is talking about an unbeliever coming into an assembly. And Paul says, look, to prophesy, which is to preach, is better than tongues, for when an unbeliever comes into an assembly, look at what Paul says behind me. It says what? The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so what? Falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. In other words, you know what that means? He's converted. He's converted. You don't find any, any picture in the New Testament of somebody falling on their face and worshiping God who's not converted. For example, Revelation eleven sixteen, and the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God. Christians, if you're a Christian, Christian, when you get to heaven, you will fall on your face and worship God. And this is what this man is doing. He's falling on his face to Jesus, the one that he knows that can heal. But there's a second thing that falling on his face shows us, and that is that he was humble. He was, he was humble. The, the path to healing, whether physical or spiritual, is the path of humility. This, this man humbled himself before Jesus. There was, there was a more famous leper in the, in the Old Testament. You remember his name? His name was Naaman. Remember Naaman? Remember what Naaman had to do? He came from Syria. He came to the prophet. And the prophet didn't even come out to see him, did he? He sent his servant. He said, if you want to be healed, go down to the Jordan River, dip yourself seven times, and you'll be healed. What did Naaman do? Yeah, he's indignant, wasn't he? He's angry. What? The Jordan River? Have you ever seen the Jordan River? It's, I, wouldn't let my, I wouldn't throw my enemy in the Jordan River. It's so dirty there. And yet, and he was indignant. He, he kind of bucked up against it. And finally, his, his servant said, well, what does it hurt to try? And he humbled himself and he dipped and he was healed. James 4 calls for readers to repent and to mourn their sin. And James uh, in verse number 10 says, 
Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. So this man, this man is, is humble as well. He's desperate, he's humble, but he also displayed faith. He displayed faith in Jesus, for he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Now, what is he saying here? He's not saying, Lord, if you have the ability, you can make me clean. He's not saying that at all. He's saying, if you're willing, you can. I know you can. I have the faith to believe that you can make me clean. Apparently, this man was not entirely sure if Jesus would heal him or not. Not could, but would. Maybe Jesus wouldn't even touch him because he was a leper. But the man knew that if Jesus was willing to do it, he could heal him. He understood that. And so he was submitting to God's sovereignty over the human body, wasn't he? He was, he was abandoning himself before the Lord. He was humbling himself. He was throwing himself at the mercy of God, at the mercy of Christ. The leper had a a full and dependent faith in the power of the Son of God. And you know what? This is how we all come to Jesus for salvation, isn't it? Did any of you come to Jesus in salvation and say, well, Jesus, I'm pretty sure I'm going to make it to heaven, but just in case, will you save me? Look, I know my brother and my sister. If anybody doesn't deserve to go to heaven, it's them. But I think I do. But just in case, none of us do that. Matter of fact, I would venture to say all of us at one time or another have thrown ourselves at Jesus' mercy and said, Jesus, if you don't work, I'm not going to heaven. If you don't save, nobody can. There is no way I'm going to heaven without your mercy. Am I right? I know I'm absolutely right. Because that's what the Bible says we do. And so we come to Jesus recognizing our desperate need, begging for healing, and believing that He, of all people, can make us clean. And so this man, not only was he desperate and humble, he was, he was also urgent. He was begging and pleading. And that's how the sinner comes. Humbly recognizing that you lay no claim on Christ, you have nothing to commend you, and the sinner comes with faith. It's, I was thinking about this this week. This is exactly what it means. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's exactly what the attitude of somebody who comes to faith in Christ has. This is what it means to hunger. This man is a classic analogy of a penitent sinner. But it doesn't, it's not just the man. There's another main character in this story, in this scene, and it's Jesus Christ, right? And I want you to notice the character of Jesus. Of all the character of Jesus that you see, the one thing that sticks out in this narrative is Jesus' compassion, isn't it? And so when somebody comes to Jesus at the end of the rope, and they admit that they have no resources of their own, knowing their own unworthiness, how does Jesus respond? With compassion. Matter of fact, Mark 1.41, same account, Mark says that he was moved with pity. He was compassionate. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him saying, what? I will be clean. And immediately, immediately, the leprosy left him. Immediately, he was completely healed. Immediately, he was no longer disfigured. Immediately, he was no longer an outcast. Immediately, he was no longer unclean. And when somebody comes to Jesus Christ in true penitence, to him as a Savior, he feels that same compassion as well. That compassion came out of that man's genuineness. Jesus could 
see his desperation. He could see his reverence. He could see his urgency. He could see his humility. He could see his faith. And he healed him. And that is just like a desperate sinner, isn't it? Leprosy always defiled. Ordinarily, when something clean touches something unclean, it becomes unclean as well. For, so for example, if, if an Israelite came in contact with a dead body, do you remember what they were supposed to do? They were unclean, and they were supposed to cleanse themselves before they could come back and worship in the community. You remember that? Because when something clean touches something unclean, the clean becomes unclean. But that's not true with Jesus. This is the first time in history that things ran the other direction. Cleanliness of Jesus healed the unclean leper. It was a, it was a total cure, a complete cure. His cleansing was complete. He had brand new skin from head to toe, and Jesus wasn't defiled or unclean or anything. And so here we see Jesus in all the grace of his salvation. We see his mercy in hearing him respond to this man's cry for help. And when the leper asked if he was willing, Jesus said that he was willing. He, he was also able, because Jesus had the power to heal, one touch, one word, and he restored the man's body. And he did this without getting contaminated, for he was immune from the defilement of this disease. His touch was like a positive infection that invaded the leper's scaly skin and made him clean again. And at the same time, this healing gesture was, it was a prophetic symbol of Jesus Christ's atoning righteousness. It's a symbol. Just as Jesus took away this man's disease and transferred healthy skin to his ailing body, so Jesus takes away the sin of every penitent sinner and imputes to us his saving righteousness. And by that, I am so glad, aren't you? And just like that, this man is no longer among the walking dead. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. Right? Following the course of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. And were by nature children of wrath. In other words, destination. Children destined for wrath. And all this shows what happens when someone gets in touch with Jesus. He alone has the power to make people whole and clean. His healing touch isn't just for lepers. It's for anybody who needs grace. Jesus has the power to heal the body. And although he, he will not bring full and final healing until the resurrection, he does have the power to restore the soul. He has the power to reconcile relationships. And most of all, he has the power to cure the deadly disease of sin. Now, what did Jesus do next? Jesus commanded him to do what? Go to the priest. Go to the priest. Now, the man may have, but I'll turn your attention, turn over with me to Mark chapter 1, verse number 45. We'll see what he did. Luke doesn't include this detail. By the way, if you want to understand more about why that is and observe more of it, come to the New Testament survey class in the Lay Bible Institute, and we'll be talking about that. Just a little plug, friendly plug there. Mark 145, what did the man do? But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. In other words, people were coming everywhere. This man immediately told everybody, and Jesus couldn't even come into the towns anymore. Now, I don't know if this man obeyed the law or not. It's possible that he did. It's possible that he was on his way to see the priest, and he just started telling everybody. But one thing is certain, and this is important, one thing is certain, he could not help himself. Isn't that another hallmark of a Christian? 
You can't help yourself. You can't help but to tell everyone about Jesus. And what was the result? The result, according to Mark, is that he can no longer walk freely in any village. All this came about because Jesus was moved with pity. He was compassionate. Now turn back to Luke chapter 5. The last verse in this short episode tells us what Jesus would do. What did, what did he do on, on occasions? And this is a, this is a major theme in, in Luke. Jesus would go off and he would pray. He would go off and pray. And that was the power of his ministry. Luke reminds us that Jesus prayed a lot. He doesn't use those words. He just talks about prayer a lot. When Jesus prayed, when Jesus taught about prayer, and, and all these sorts of things. Prayer is what moves ministry. That's the power of the ministry. That is why Jesus went off and prayed. Parents, I know you get tired of me saying this. Do you want power behind the spiritual ministry to your children? Then pray. Grandparents, do you want spiritual power behind your ministry to your grandchildren? Then pray. Ministry leaders, do you want power? Then pray. God moves when people pray. And the pattern is set by the prayer, of Je- prayer life of Jesus. Now, let me close. I don't, I don't want to make this an analogy. This, this healing episode is not an analogy, but there's an irresistible picture of salvation here. The, think about this. This man, this is a man who was fully tainted by leprosy. He was full of leprosy. We are full of sin. It affects every part of our lives just like it affected every part of his life. This man was an outcast. Just like we are separated from the, from the, the body of Christ until our salvation, right? Right? It affects every part of our lives. This man knew that only Jesus could heal, and he was desperate. And when we realize the precarious nature of our own lives, that there is an eternity waiting for us, and a just God who will judge the the living and the dead one day, we realize how precarious our position is. And so we know that if something doesn't change, We will die in our sin and so we become desperate. And we know that only one man can change our condition. That one man is the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And when he humbled himself before Christ, this man, he was fully and completely healed, head to toe. And when we humble ourselves before Jesus Christ and and beg for his healing of our sin, for our salvation, Give us new life. He answers with compassion and saves us from head to toe. We are now saints in Jesus Christ, aren't we? What does John tell us? Think about this, the cleansing of the leper in, in conjunction with John. 1 John 1, nine. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? Cleanse. There's that cleansing picture. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Just as the leper was cleansed from all leprosy, Jesus Christ cleanses us from all defilement of sin. Isn't that wonderful? When you stand before Jesus Christ, if you are in Christ, I'm sorry, when you stand before the throne of God, if you are in Christ, then God sees Christ's righteousness in you because you are righteous And he does not see your sin. He doesn't bring it up again. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you've come to the place where spiritually you are like this man, and you fall at the feet of the one who can heal of all our spiritual affirmities, he will heal you, and he will cleanse you, and he will make you a new creation. Now let me ask you one question as we close. Has Jesus healed you? Have you humbled yourself before God and said, Lord, 
I cannot make it to heaven on my own. I am defiled, I am sinful, and I do not deserve eternity with you. But I know that Jesus will make me clean. And I'm trusting what Jesus did to make me clean. Have you done that? Have you put your faith in Jesus? It's not the prayer that saves. It's the desperate attitude of faith and trust in Christ. He saves the ones who trust him. Have you done that? Lord, I thank you for this wonderful picture that we see in the life of Christ. This is an actual healing This is an actual event, an actual leper. And Jesus Christ is an actual Savior. And while the purpose of this passage, Lord, was to show uh, the healing of this man, there is also a picture of our salvation that we'll see so clearly next week. Lord, I pray, as I pray often, if there are any in this assembly who are not in Christ, I pray that today will be their day of salvation. Amen.